So to kick things off, because you don't want to hear me talk all day, I'd like in to introduce our keynote speakers and one of today's workshop mentors, 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 the wonderful Katie Steele. Uh, if there's one thing that you can remember about Katie, it's her incredible voice. It's undeniable, ethereal, dramatic and melodic. She's an artist with almost two decades in the Australian music industry who continues to impress. She hails from Perth, from a family of musicians, including her father, blues legend Nick Rick Steele, and her brother Luke Steele from the Sleepy Jackson and Empire of the Sun. And she has shaped her own brand of music with influences from The Pretenders to Blondie to Fleetwood Mac, all while sprinkled with her love of melodic pop. Um, speaking with Katie today is Kelly Goodgen from ABC Pilbara. Uh, Kelly landed in the northwest of Western Australia after travelling the country in a caravan with her family. Uh, for four years, she stopped by Karatha after a short work break and then fell in love with the lifestyle of the area. She has been in the region for two years now and loves everything about the place. The people, the lifestyle, the incredible environment and even the weather. And as someone from the East Coast, I think that's a shocking statement. Um, so yeah, please welcome Katie and Kelly to the stage with a warm round of applause. Steroids. <laughs> <laughs> Much bigger than yours. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Hello to everyone. Are you or? I don't know. You can hear us without these, can't you? Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. We need them for the camera. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right, let's play nice. <laughs> um, and now, uh, I think you had an old intro there because I've actually been in the Pilbara for about five years. <laughs> not, right. not that we're comparing or anything like that, but um, I, I just want to say welcome to the regional sessions here in Karatha. We are meeting today on Nalama land and I also want to thank the traditional custodians of the land and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, I am Kelly Gudgeon, I'm the breakfast presenter at ABC Pilbara and I'm really honoured to have been asked to be part of this event today and to have the opportunity to sit with one of my musical heroes, Katie Steele. Oh, thanks. <laughs> um, and, you know, lead her in this keynote speaker session for, um, for the regional sessions. Now, many of you are songwriters and musicians and obviously Katie's already been introduced, so I'm not going to go back over her uh, musical royalty. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a little bit of a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe we get straight into the questions. Um, Katie, welcome to the Pilbara and welcome to Karatha. Thanks for having me. I was uh, sweating last night at the, <laughs> at the local wine bar. It was particularly Sweat warm. dripping down my back. It was lovely. <laughs> As I said, welcome to the Pilbara. <laughs> <laughs> now, we've touched a little bit um, already. We've heard about the start of your musical journey. But can you talk us through what those early days were like for you? How did you know that music was going to be your life and those early years of songwriting? Um, well, I wasn't planning on getting into music. It just kind of happened. Um, but I was brought up around music. So my dad is a musician. So he has run a local blues club for like the last 20 years. So we used to go, that was every Tuesday night, we'd go up to the blues club and stay up late and watch, you know, old guys doing 12 bars over and over and over. Um, but yeah, it was cool, like you'd get some international artists, you get a lot of local artists, but you know, we were exposed to a lot of music. Um, and then I have three older, well, I have two older brothers and a twin brother. So, you know, family of pretty much boys and me, um, my older brother started playing instruments. So then generally you kind of follow what your siblings do. So I started on bass guitar, but um, my plan was to, I wanted to um, make film clips for bands. I was like obviously obsessed with music but loved like the, the film side of things. So I went to TAFE and did um, film and then by the end of the first year we had some local artists come in and we were making videos for them and I was just like, man, these guys suck, I could do better than this. <laughs> so literally a month later we were filming my video for my band that I'd formed just from out of like... I don't know, I was like, just, it was just something inside of me that was like, I just got to give it a shot. And was that Little Birdie, that band that formed nah, then? That no, was that was before Little Birdie. Yeah, that was, um, 
That was my first band called The Plastic Scene. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were actually really cool. It was me and this other guy. Um, and he kind of wrote the, the beats and I just kind of sung on top. It was a bit like um, like Zero Seven, like those, that kind of band. Like, it, was, it was quite cool. But yeah, he was more interested in like smoking, smoking marijuana than he was having a career in music. And I was like pretty driven at, at quite a young age. So went off and started writing songs and then Little Birdie formed within like a couple of weeks. It was like super quick. Talking about being a young age, um, being in a successful band like Little Birdie at a young age, it's a big thing. Can you talk about what that was like for you, especially as a young woman and because you were touring the world at a pretty young age, you were about 19 or something, were you? Yeah, I was in New York on my 19th birthday and I was like, what the hell, playing a showcase. Um, yeah, it was pretty full on, to be honest. Um, luckily, the guys in the band were kind of like big brothers. They were a lot older than me. They were all like in their 30s. So I was like 10 years younger than them. Um, so they kind of looked after me like in a lot of ways, um, helped me through, you know, the, sorry, itchy nose. <laughs> helped me through the emotions, I guess, as well as kind of holding things down. Like I didn't know a lot about the technical side of things. Like all I really knew was how to write songs and how to sing and how to perform. But there's so much more that goes into being in a band. Like there's a lot of, a lot of stuff behind the scenes that you have to do. It's really a big full-time job. We'll tease that out a bit in a moment. Um, but can you talk a bit more about the experiences you had when Little Birdie were at the height of popularity? Talk about the what, sorry? When Little Birdie was at the height of popularity. What were some of those experiences that stand out? Um, playing like the Big Day Art Festivals. I think we did two or three of those. They were definitely a highlight because they were probably some of the biggest audiences and being able to be on that tour was like a really cool moment in time. Um, and we always had like huge crowds. So that, they're defi that's definitely a highlight. Um, and then another highlight was we um, supported REM. Um, we just opened, like we only got to do like four songs. <laughs> but like doing a big arena show like that was really cool. Um, yeah, that's some of the main, working with Paul Kelly um, on quite a few occasions has been quite a bit of a highlight as well. Now we hear some wild stories about musicians. Uh, do you ever throw TVs out of windows of hotels or anything like that? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's so funny. Like my brother's, my brother Luke, he's in a band as well. He's a bit more of a rock star, but um, the guys in my band, as I said, they were older, Simon, his um, claim to fame was having a Milo and a biscuit after each show. <laughs> so I was like, come on, man. <laughs> so, yeah, the guy, the other guy, the other two in the band, you know, would have a drink. But, yeah, it was, to be honest, like, those guys were pretty, pretty mellow. Um, at times a little uh, on the dull side. <laughs> so, yeah, as a young, a young person, I was kind of like, come on, guys, let's go and hang out. So wasn't that exciting to be honest. It wasn't wild. It's always about the show, like the show is always the main thing and I actually um, lost my voice on a few occasions from partying so it's it's kind of like, yeah, you got to, you actually have to really look after yourself and especially these days there's so much more work that's involved in being a musician. You're not just a musician now, you're actually, you know, you've got to do your social media, you've got to do your admin, you've got to run your website, you've got to, there's about a million jobs so you've, kind of got to be an athlete as well like you got to be fit you got to pump that pump it you got to stay fit and it's uh yeah you can't really afford to be drinking every night and you know cutting loose so how is it different now for oh, I mean I say young musicians but any musician starting out to what it was like back when you were starting out well I would say it's a lot more work but like even just sitting here talking to you, I think it still was a lot of work back in the day. Like, you know, there's just a lot of, like I was saying, logistics into going into, you know, there's a lot of time at airports and, you know, loading the gear, unpacking the car, packing the car, setting up, sound check, you know, you know, selling merch after the show, ordering the merch, doing the merch. Like it's, the list is just huge. Like it's a, and it's quite a draining, you know, job, I'm really talking you guys out of it. <laughs> Don't be a musician. 
No, it's just um, I love it and I enjoy it, but yeah, you don't really stop. It's more of a not a lifestyle because it's a job, but it's you know you have to be really invested in and love what you do and yeah. It's definitely not nine to five or you know nah. three to ten or whatever. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I mean, obviously you are um, an inspiration to many musicians. Um, you've been around for a long time, uh, particularly women. But who do you look up to? Who are your inspirations? Um, I really look up to um, people like Charlie XEX, which just from a songwriting point of view, like she's always, I don't think she's like an amazing songwriter, but she's a great pop writer and she's always continually putting out new music and that's one of my goals is to be a bit more prolific because I have thousands of songs um, and when I was in America, I spent like six years living in New York and I did about three different records of different types, different genres of, of music and I've never released any of it and it's <laughs> it's frustrating to do so much work and not have anyone hear it. So one of my goals is to be a bit more prolific and find the right releasing team to kind of just keep putting things out there. So I've got another song coming out in two weeks, yes. Um, <laughs> but yeah, but uh, yeah, who else? I, I look up to people like, um, well, she's a bit older now, but Carol King just as like a as a writer, just such a good songwriter. Wrote for other people, wrote for wrote like such amazing songs all throughout the sixties and seventies. Tapestry is like the best record. Uh, Kate Bush, you know all the classics. I just look up to all those uh, women as songwriters. Um, but yeah, I just respect anyone that's kind of just works hard and is true to themselves. Because um, yeah, it's a hard business to. It's a slog, especially mothers. Like I've got two kids now, and um, it's definitely been more challenging. But luckily, I've got a good babysitter, my mum. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now let's talk about songwriting and your songwriting process. How do you approach writing a song? Can you talk us through that process? Um, yeah, with me, it just starts on the piano or on the guitar, um, and it's just it's kind of weird. It's like I'll just sit there, and it just it's almost like some, something comes over me and it's not even me writing it. I know other people have talked about this, other artists, but that's how I... It's just this weird zone that I get into and it just kind of like falls out. And then I go back, so I basically push record on my voice recorder and then I go back and kind of edit it, almost like you're editing a book. So I'll go back and go, oh, that bit's really good. and Oh, that bit's amazing, chuck that in there. And then... Then I might grab another section from another thing I was working on and it's kind of like this, it's kind of like painting and so you just kind of weave it together and that's how I work. And with the new record though, um, we've done all the production at home. So we've, me and my husband um, have spent like the last two and a half years working on all the songs. So we've done not only all the songwriting, we've done all the production as well. So like all the bass, the drums, the everything we've done as well, so that's added a whole level of madness. <laughs> a lot of people will outsource a producer and say, yeah, you do all that and send it back to me, but yeah, we've, it's, it's kind of common these days for artists to do that now, so. Yeah, um, do you find it easier writing the music or the lyrics? I mean, you just said it's like an out-of-body experience for you, so how do you, what comes to you first? Um, yeah, it's usually at the same time, so it's just like a flow thing. But then if I don't write it quickly, because like some of the best songs that I've written, I don't actually remember writing it. I'm like, how did that even happen? And it's usually when you have to go back, like I was saying, sometimes I'll leave, leave them and just let them kind of marinate. But when you go back to like do the lyrics, sometimes that's like a real challenge because you're not in back in that, you got to get back in that zone. And so I'd say the challenges for me are definitely the lyrics, like going back and getting into that that feel. Has it always been like that for you, That's that way of writing, yeah? Yeah, yeah. and that's just how I fell into it, really. Do you think it's harder or easier now for people to write music? And um, if you, do you know when you're writing a song, I mean, you said you just, you don't even realise you're doing it sometimes, but do you know <laughs> whether, do, do you know where it's gonna be a hit? I mean, you definitely know when you're like striking gold, versus 
having said that, I've gone back and listened to things that I thought were really not very good and gone, oh, that's actually really cool. So it, de- it does depend what mood you're in. Like if you're in a mood where you kind of, um, yeah, you definitely know when you're, when you're hidden hidden gold though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, many songwriters write songs for other musicians and obviously some people specialise in that. Are you, can you write for someone else or is it only for you? Um, yeah, I've dabbled in it but I kind of feel like because I'm such a kind of emotional writer, it's, I feel like a lot of, I've been in a bunch of sessions where you're kind of writing with like three other people and I feel like it just has this kind of cookie cutter approach to it which I like um, but for me yeah, I found that it was not really close to what I want to do. It felt a bit forced or something. But, um, yeah, I would love to write more for other people. I think it's, like I was saying before, it's at the moment my priority is just getting my own music out. <laughs> when you are collaborating with other people, when you are sitting in a group of, you know, two, three other people, how do you uh, manage that collaboration process and make sure that everybody's contributing? I don't know. I think it's just kind of organically happens and yeah everyone just has to be kind of aware of everyone else's space and everyone's ideas and just allowing yeah allowing everyone to have have an opinion and you know I think that's the important thing from all these sessions is to realize is that everyone's opinion is valid like and just if you know just because I might have a name doesn't mean I know everything in fact I could probably learn something from you guys from this like um I probably will learn a lot from you guys because you're coming at it from a different angle. And when I first started writing songs, I didn't know anything about writing songs. I just sat there and wrote a song. And my point is there's a beauty in the inexperience and there's a beauty in not knowing everything <laughs> or knowing chords and, I mean, scales and all, like I don't, I was ne- I'm self-taught is my point. So, you know, anyone can do it, I think. Is there anyone that you'd like to write a song with, like like to co- collaborate with? <sighs> Probably like Max Martin. Does anyone know who that is? No, Max Martin. He's written uh, probably like every single number one song you've heard on the charts. He's from Sweden um, and he, he wrote Hit Me Baby One More Time. He's written like every single hit that you could ever think of in the last. He could be the next Britney Spears. Yeah. <laughs> 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 have you um, ever sat down to write a song, like deliberately sat down to write a song and had a block and how have you overcome that? Uh, just walk away. <laughs> Go put a load of washing on. <laughs> yeah, you can't force it. Um, I especially now don't have a lot of spare time like, and usually when I have time it's, you know, answering emails and, and kind of, you know, doing other stuff that... Um, that you have to do to run a business. Um, so when I do have time, it's for writing. Um, you're just kind of focusing on on songs that have the most strength, I guess, and yeah, trying to finish off ideas and stuff. But I, I feel like definitely it's not worth for, worth forcing it if um, if you're not in the in the flow. Have uh, music and music productions obviously changed a lot since your early days? Um, back when you were young, um, you know, <laughs> when you were young. when you were younger, <laughs> oh my God. Um, people. I mean, oh. the the way the music industry then was, you did gigs, you you know, you um, put out CDs. <laughs> mm. um, it's t- totally different now. So. Um, we're we're looking at uh, an industry now where there's been the impact of digital and electronic music. Um, how has the, do you think that's impacted the music industry? Well, it's obviously a lot more crowded now. Like it's, I mean, a hundred thousand songs get uploaded to Spotify a day, so that's a lot. <laughs> a lot of songs. How do you stand out um, from that? Um, but you know, I think it's also a good thing. Like you know, yourselves. You could go home and write a song right now because if you've got a computer and you've got logic, you know, you've got loops in there, you've got instruments, everything is available on a laptop now, which back when I, back in my day, <laughs> God, everyone's making me feel so old. <laughs> God, I, I feel, still feel like I'm 20, what the hell? But I'm not. Um, yeah, you know, back in the day, it, you had to go to a studio, you had to pay a producer, to plug everything in and 
you know, you'd be there for the whole day and you'd smash it out. And, yeah, it was really expensive as well. Um, it's still expensive now because, like, I get good guys to mix, you know, like, we, we paid this guy 1500 bucks to mix each song on the record, so times that by 10, that's 15 grand right there. <laughs> then you got to get it mastered. You know, there's a lot of um, expenses still, but um, you can do most of the work at home. You just have to, I would say, from experience, set yourself a deadline. <laughs> You were talking before about, uh, you know, that you've done a lot of the production for this new album at home um, with your husband. Uh, do you think the role of a producer now, because people have uh, home home studios, is redundant in a way? No way. No? The producer's never been more important because everyone, everyone, the production is kind of everything now. I'd say, if anything, songwriting is getting put to the back, like, if you listen to Kelvin Harris or something, it's like, is there a song there? Don't think so. <laughs> Not that I can hear, um, which I think is a real shame because I'll always be a songwriter and always... I mean, look, Ed Sheeran and people like that are still writing songs. Not that they're very good, but, you know, it, the production's never been more important, I think. I'd say, if anything, get into production, learn how drums work and and synths and work see how sonics work and you'll you'll have a job for sure has that been a real process for you like learning that role of producer um and setting that up at home yeah yeah it's been really cool um learning more about what you actually like what you don't like yeah drum sound and just it's really cool how available it all is like there's just so much out there there's so many really cool like drum packs you can get and we've got like a cool selection of synths which you can't use on every single song because otherwise it all sounds the same but there's a lot and there's so many good um what are they called like serum and stuff what are they called plugins. yeah the plug-in the what's serum though that's like an amp um, the, um, yeah yeah like there's yeah like yeah so there's like these synth it's like a, yeah a sampler you know that what are they called? This yeah, is that a sampler? VST. Yeah, VST. Yeah, yeah, VST, which stands for uh, virtual, virtual studio. something. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, yeah, you get these these. You know, it's like an app. Like you know, it's like a plugin. You get up, and there's like thousands of sounds, and I mean that in itself can just create. Like you can write a song instantly with just the, the inspiration is endless. So that is the good thing. You know, yeah. if you can apply writing a song with that and yeah, yeah, it's, it's full on, it's cool. Uh, going back to songwriting for a bit, um, yeah, I mean, some of the biggest songs in our history have always been around events and, you know, things like that. I'm thinking, you know, war and uh, mm. uh, things um, like that. So do you look to world events or current events or anything like that to write a song or is it more personal? Yeah, I don't. I wish I could, but I just feel like every time I've tried to do anything like that, it's super cheesy. Um, so I just, I just stick to the sad, sad songs. <laughs> um, I guess I always just write about like, yeah, like emotion, and it's always just about like feelings. And I don't know, that's just what I've always done. And yeah, I think people make their own interpretation about what it means to them which i think is also cool so you get your own connection but yeah i wish i could write about more but i just feel like it would be a bit uh yeah a bit cheesy is there one song or album that you've released that you're most proud of um probably confetti um the which was our third album um yeah just really proud of that record because um it was recorded live um, in Sing Sing Studios in Melbourne. So we set up and we basically played the whole thing live and then we had some backing singers come in and then we had, do we have strings? I don't know. But basically it was it was just, a, we self-produced it with another guy, so the engineer. And it was just, yeah, it's just a really good body of work, I think. Like every single song I think is really good. So yeah, that's probably the one I'm most proud of. Now, it's not the sexy side of the industry, but um, <laughs> you've alluded to it, and that's, you know, things that, um, like the legal side of things. Um, what's been your experience in dealing with things like contracts and agreements, and as a songwriter, copyright, especially in a band situation? 
where everyone might be writing? Yeah, my thing's always been um, from pretty early on in the band, I was like, I'm the writer and this is, I'm writing the songs. <laughs> um, and yeah, I've always been pretty strong about that. Um, but yeah, that, that was the situation that I, I was in with my band. Like, um, our guitarist was a writer as well, but then we released a couple of his songs and it just didn't feel right for me to be kind of singing his song. So, um, and I just didn't like them as much as my songs. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how that worked in that band. But in terms of contracts and stuff, um, yeah, it's just, just always gotta have a lawyer. Just have a lawyer, make sure you read everything properly and make sure you've got a good manager, I guess, um, someone that you trust. But having said that, managers are becoming pretty redundant these days as well because there's not a lot of money to be made and if they're taking 20% of nothing, it's uh, <laughs> not a lot. Um, I'd say an agent is more beneficial these days. Uh, they take 10%, um, but they're the ones that email you with the gig offers, so that's uh, probably more important these days. And that's r that's where your income comes from, is it? it yeah. It's now, yeah. Live shows, yeah. Uh, and, I mean, go, but, um, talking about that, the way we consume music these days has changed completely. Um, back when Little Birdie was selling albums, as I said before, um, we were buying CDs, uh, going to gigs, buying merch. Can you just talk more about that transition that you've seen over the years and how you as a songwriter and a musician have navigated that? Um... I guess you just keep going um, and you, yeah, you try and stay with the times. Um, yeah, I mean, people are still making money. Um, merch, yeah, is a big one, but I mean, how many T-shirts do you need to sell to, you know, <laughs> keep the lights on? There's a few T-shirts. But uh, yeah, that for me, live shows is how I pay my bills. So um, yeah, I guess it's just, um, all about content these days as well, so smash out the, the live videos. <laughs> Where do you think the future of the music industry is going? Well, definitely online. Um, I know you said to me when we spoke the other day you were going to be writing jingles. <laughs> yeah, I was having a laugh about that, but uh, I shouldn't be laughing now. <laughs> no, I just think it's, um, you know, I think it's a younger market. Um, you know, there's a lot of um, TikTok and all those kind of platforms actually can, you know, in some ways can kind of break an artist. But I guess my whole thing is like, can they go and sell a show out um, and play an hour and a half worth of good songs? So that's, but do they care about that? So it's a, <laughs> it's a very hard thing now. You've got YouTube as well. A lot of, you know, a lot of people break it through there and... Um, I guess it's, yeah, can you maintain, you know, can you maintain a career from that is my question. But um, maybe they can. They just do more videos. <laughs> Keep pumping it out. I don't know. What's the one piece of advice that uh, someone gave to you when you were starting out that really stuck? Um, have, a, have a side job? No. <laughs> No, I've actually have never have had a side job, luckily. I still live off music, which is pretty amazing. Um, no, my mum basically said, uh, always have a backup. That was her advice. Um, so my brother Luke, who's now in a really famous band, studied graphic design. Um, he did that until his band took off. Um, yeah, I actually don't have a backup, so... <laughs> um, but uh, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't think anyone's really given me advice. I think something I've probably just learnt is just be true to yourself and work hard and be honest. Um, and is that would that be your advice to someone starting out now? Yeah, another thing I'd say is trust your gut. Like that's super important. Um, and yeah, trust trust your gut to find the right people to work for you or work with you because if you work with the wrong people, they're just gonna really screw things up for you. So try and find a good team once you get to that level, of course. And then, I don't know, just just be you. Has anyone got any questions for Katie? Ready to get out? Yeah. <laughs> um, talking about like, having that music and how important it is having a team around you, how important time when releasing 
same time. Like so, like, in terms of have, like, the right times in the market or right times for you? Um, I don't know. I guess that would be a question for your distributor or whatever. Like, but I feel like um, Spotify and everything need, like, eight weeks, I think, before... So you submit it to them eight weeks before, but I guess time-wise, it just depends what you've got happening. Like if you've got like live shows or a tour or something, you know, is that what you mean? Or I kind of mean like I guess like knowing that you have that music created, yeah, like wanting to sit on it and having the right team. Like can you not release it until you have the right support around you? Ah, oh, I see what you mean. Um, I don't know. I kind of feel like these days it's good to just get it out there and then the right people will find you. Like, that's what I've been telling myself as well. <laughs> like, because you could just be wait, waiting like five years until the right person comes along. Because to be honest, it's it's pretty hard out there. Like, you know, a lot of managers are now doing other things to, you know, getting to events or like it's, to just make money from music is pretty hard unless you're like Ed Sheeran. Like, you know, even the lower tier kind of artists like myself, like, you know, it's still hard to sell tickets. And back in the, like, it, even two years, before COVID, like, I would sell out shows instantly. But now it's a bit more, maybe I'm just not relevant. <laughs> but no, it's, it's it's everywhere, like, you know, and being local as well, um, it's definitely harder. So I'd say do as much as you can by yourself. Like, just be like a one man, one woman business. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I've been signed to Sony ATV for like since the age of like uh, 23 or something. Um, to be honest, they didn't get me a lot of like, and we were like pretty established band. They didn't get us a lot of like movies and stuff. Um, I'd say that like you can find a lot of companies online now that you know go in and do it for you and because they've got a bit more on the line you find that these big publishers they they sign you and you give you they give you a bunch of money but they kind of just do the bare minimum um so again that's a whole other um like that's a whole other discussion like that i would actually like to know more about myself <laughs> um so maybe someone can fill me in the right direction you mentioned COVID before. It's yes. the, you know, the elephant in the room really, isn't it? Yeah. Has the industry recovered since then? I don't think so, no. Nah. Like, the problem with with the whole COVID thing, the whole COVID thing, um, is that because we've had two years off, everyone's releasing, everyone's doing shows, everyone's trying to catch up, and the whole market is just so flooded. Um, I'm not really looking... I'm doing a big tour in July and August and I'm like, ugh, I'm really nervous about it because I just feel like it's just so crowded. I mean, even in Perth, you had uh, Rod Stewart and Cindy Lauper on the Friday. Saturday night, you had Ed Sheeran, oh, no, Sunday night, and Bjork. And, you know, the week before that, it was someone else. It's just every every week there's someone new playing. Um, a lot of more, I've just noticed so many more internationals coming here now, which is great for for people, for punters, but I feel like for for the Australian artists, it's getting harder for us to stand out or be relevant, I guess, against that international flood flooding. <laughs> is that a good opportunity then for artists to get more into regional areas? Because we yeah. are often starved for live yeah. music. Yeah, that, that's a good point, yeah. I mean, I'm he playing here tomorrow night. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, that's a good point, definitely. I think maybe we just need to expand, yeah. Anyone else got any questions for Katie? Yeah. Jeff, uh, you feel better supported locally in Australia or internationally? And follow up, have you got any uh, unsuspecting pockets of fans just to kind of turn up somewhere randomly in the world that kind of pick up your music? Nah. <laughs> I wish they would. <laughs> Um, no, nah, not that I know of. Uh, I don't know, I don't really look at that stuff too closely, like, because, um, yeah, I don't know. It's weird, though, because my brother is in Empire of the Sun. He's got all these, like, hardcore fans that live all over the world and they've started following, like, my family. <laughs> so I've got a bunch of his weird fans, like, from <laughs> Germany and, like, all these weird places that are obsessed with him, but now they're obsessed with me. <laughs> So that, I guess that kind of works in that way. 
Um, and what was the first question? Oh uh, yeah, well, I, yeah, I'm not really well known outside of Australia, really. So this is my only. I mean, I'm hoping to change that, but <laughs> yeah, Australia is um, my main market. Yeah. Have you had any really weird fan experiences? Mm, no, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. No one asking you to sign their breasts or anything. I don't know. I got really. <laughs> no, oh yeah, that happens all the time. <laughs> it's just. Just do it. I'm just, just a, you know, just a, I'm just not human to them, you know. I just say yes, yes, whatever, sure. Show me your tit. Sorry, am I allowed to say tit? <laughs> Where's the moderator? <laughs> yeah. Uh, any other questions? True. Um. Yeah. 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 Um. My. Daughter, she's um, nearly five. She's um, she really likes like Katy Perry and uh, like Harry Styles and all those like poppy kind of songs. But um, and then the baby, who's like eleven months old, is like super into music. And she, um, my husband put my song on on the other day, and she was like looking at it, like and then looking at me. So she, I think she already knows my voice. But yeah, it's cool. It's Kind of just going to let them find their own feet with it, though. Not going to push it into them too much. How old were you when you picked up a musical instrument? It's like 18. So, so you didn't pick up a guitar or anything like that before oh, 18? I played... I'm um, oh yeah. sorry, that's a lie. I was, I was probably like um, 16 or something when I played bass. But then I didn't start playing guitar or piano until I was, yeah, about 18. And then, like, Little Birdie was like a thing when I was 19, so it was literally about like six months between playing, a in like my first gig, I was sitting down playing guitar because I couldn't stand up <laughs> playing it. So that's how quickly things happened for me. Any other questions? Do you still do vocal instruction stuff? What do you mean? Uh, like, do you mean like lessons or something? Yeah, so... Oh. Oh, no. Nah. nah. Yeah, no, nah, I don't do that. But, um, yeah, well, I went and saw a singing teacher when I was, like, 16 or something. Um, and she was like, you don't need lessons. I don't want to change your tone. So that was quite cool that she said that. She was a jazz singer. And I'm kind of glad that she was like, just don't change what you're doing. So... Yeah, with me it was just about finding the confidence to like stand up in front of people and that was like the main thing and the only thing you can do with that is just give yourself time and just let yourself like build the confidence like naturally and just start off small, like start off singing in front of your family or something and then build up to like, you know, the local hall and then build up to wherever, you know what I mean? Just build up to proper shows. <laughs> Oh, no, I would like to. If I had more time, I would definitely... I want to get lessons um, because I'm very basic, like, very, very basic, like, self-taught with piano, guitar, songwriting, singing, everything's just self-taught. Um, so it would be good to know a few more, you know, scales and things like that because I think it actually would help me at this point. <laughs> but uh, it's just, yeah, trying to find the time in between, trying to run a business and family and stuff, so... Yeah, I do recommend it. <laughs> you were talking then about, uh, you know, that practising getting up in front of people to get the confidence, but do you think that's a lost art as we move into more digital music where people are creating songs From your home? bedroom, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah but it's kind of like what I'm saying. Like if, if someone says, here's a million bucks to go play a gig in LA, can you stand up there and can you actually put on a good show? Because uh, the art... I must say, the art of, like, a good front person will never die. Like, I went and saw uh, Bon Iver the other night and I was super excited to go and see him or them. They're a band, but it's mainly him. And it was so disappointing. Yeah. He was so flat. He had these headphones on his head and it was like, dude, like, I've paid, like, $120 to come and see you play. 
you can say something to the audience, just give me something. And yeah, the art of the front person will never, you have to involve your crowd and make them feel like it's so much effort to get to a show. Like it's so expensive. Like you have to treat your audience with a res respect that you, they're even there to see you. I, I was pretty disappointed. Bjork was amazing though. She's just wonderful. Isn't yeah. She? I saw her at the big day out years yeah. ago. Amazing. Yeah. She didn't talk a lot either, but like her art is just speaks for itself. So any other questions? Yeah. And Richard's good experience with the big day out. Um, yeah. it's a bit seeing what's your take on that. Is that, is that something you should um, aspire to or even um, yeah, is it is it a machine or is it uh, is it is it a good stepping stone to Oh yeah. If you can get on them then yeah. yeah. But you know, you're not gonna get on them unless you're on Triple J. So I'd say that's my only thing. Like there needs to be some other festivals opening up for that double J market because you know, I'm on Double J now, um, but a lot of internationals get straight onto Double J as well. Um, like Caroline Polachek's new records on there at the moment, and it's there's a real like gap in the market for like the 30 to 50 age or even 25 to 50 age market because a lot of those festivals are Triple J market now, and they just get the same bands and just rehash the same lineups over and over. <laughs> Am I going to get in trouble for this panel? <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, yeah, so, yeah, there's a real gap in the market, I think, for those types of festivals. Um, I guess you've got Perth Fest and all those ones opening up, which are, you know, that really cater towards a more art kind of audience. But, I mean, yeah, if you can get on the festival, mate, you're, you're winning. But, yeah, it's just getting getting booked onto them is the hard thing. Triple J were such a, you know, like such a supporter of live local music for, and they still are, but uh, you were talking then about um, how hard it is for bands who are not part of that demographic anymore mm, or, yeah, or will well, never be. Well, the demographic's 18 to 23 or something. Is and that? it seems to be a particular style of music. What's well, like the TikTok crowd? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, mean, are you guys on that? TikTok or hands up who's on TikTok? Only like five, five of you. Cody, is that Cody? Yeah, Cody. Cody's on TikTok. <laughs> Cody's playing with me tomorrow night, actually. Yeah. Aren't you? I am. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd be more excited. <laughs> He's like... <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. 18 to 23, so... You know, where where's the whole other market go? It's a, in the UK, you've got BBC Six and... Yeah, Australia needs to step it up, man, big time. Sure do. Any other questions? Yep. When it came to song creation for you, and I understand that you're saying you're an emotional writer and you mm -hmm. write all of your songs, do you find that when it came to the actual, like, music creation, mm -hmm. did you play a part into that or was that including, like, your band creating the music and you had your say on it? Like um, yeah, I was definitely involved in that as well. Like, yeah, I'm a bit of a control freak. <laughs> um, like, I couldn't play the parts that they were saying but I'd be like no play that note or play that and so I'd literally write the chords and then they would write the like the melodies around but I would be involved in that and also involved in how they sound as well like so we were really into like you know the sounds of like Fleetwood Mac and those organic kind of sounds so you know I was quite um, hands-on yeah Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, we used to be really into this band called Midlake, who were from Texas. So we were really into them for a while. And yeah, that was the cool thing. As a band, we were like vibing out. Like we liked this band called Spoon as well for a while. And yeah, you remember Spoon? They were cool. Um, yeah, so, and obviously the classics, like we were, we would definitely vibe out together as a, as a band and kind of listen to all the things that we digged, but yeah. That was that was fun. There was another question over here. I saw someone's hand go up at the back. I just wanted to ask you more about your time in New York. Mm. You said you um, had, of course, three different albums. Yeah. Is there a reason for that or are you just... You uh, 
Yeah, I was trying to find myself, yeah. <laughs> First guy I worked with, um, so I'd, I'd done about the whole album, I'd done kind of by myself at the, in the home studio, but I'd, I wasn't really, it sounded kind of twee or something, like it wasn't high end enough, it was very kind of lo-fi. So I went into a studio with a guy to try and make it kind of more hi-fi and then it just didn't work. So that, you know, there's like a real fine art to getting the right producer, otherwise it just ruins the whole thing. So that didn't really work, so I kind of just scrapped that. And then I started working with um, this other guy. He was Nigerian, so he was like this amazing producer. So then we were writing more kind of pop stuff. Like I was really into Sia at the time, so I was like, let's write a banger. So that was super produced stuff. But then again, that didn't really feel like me either. So then, yeah, then I went back to, got back to Australia and just ended up putting out, um, working with a guy in Perth and releasing something. I just was over it. <laughs> <laughs> well, all those um, songs that you were talking about before that have never been released, uh, are you going to release them at some point? Yeah, I think I'm going to release some of them, yeah. I have to. They're just sitting there. Some of them are absolute bangers. I wish I could plan for you right now. Uh, we're running out of time, but any other final questions before we finish up? Anyone else? Yep. What's your favourite song? <laughs> oh, on the spot. No comment. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's too hard. Not answering it. Sorry. I mean, yeah, no, I, I, that's just too hard. Sorry. What's your favourite song? Good question. Hey. <laughs> Another one? Yeah. What about finding gigs? I guess because you already you already have a name for yourself and yeah. you've done gigs for about like a fair while. Yeah. So do you find do you reach out to the gigs personally or do you have like an agent that you're personally? Yeah, I've got an agent, but like I instigate things all the time because that's how I make more money and that's how I'm more active. So it was my idea to play tomorrow night. I, s I got in touch with my agent and said, How about I do a show? And they were like, Okay. So, you know, you have to be smart and you have to like want to work and yeah like if you like are you local up here yeah you know like you could hit up like a local restaurant or something and be like hey do you want to have someone playing music like you have to be driven and you have to like create opportunities like that's the biggest thing i've learned is you just have to be thinking ahead all the time because agents they're pretty lazy like they'll just do the bare minimum because they get 10% and they're like, okay, whatever. And it's like, nah, I need like more options. So, but you do need them because they do all the contracts and they do all the boring stuff that you don't want to deal with. <laughs> um, I do a little bit in Perth. Um, obviously I live there, but, and my studio is there and stuff, but uh, yeah, the big tour that I'm doing in July and August, um, that's everywhere, so like Tasmania up to Cairns to everywhere, Margaret River, Bunbury, Albany, you name it, I'm going there. <laughs> I ask um, all of you, I mean, you're musicians and songwriters and Katie was talking about instigating gigs, um, we don't have a huge live um, kind of scene here in Karatha. How do you go about sort of getting that experience of playing live? Are, are you instigating gigs? Are you going to, to venues and saying, we could do it? do more things up here. Well, I have to say that um, we have somebody fabulous in the city now who is actually trying to do that, Evie. <laughs> so, um, oh, yeah. cool. <laughs> Yay. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, we don't have a huge music scene here nah. in Karatha and it's been like that for as long as I've been here, the last yeah. five years. So, 
uh, you, I think everybody's desperate for mm. more live music. Yeah. Do they use this place much for things? Not really. I guess it's just like, can you make money from it? It's so expensive now to tour. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, it's like if you go and play a venue, like you've got to pay to hire the venue. You've got to pay the sound guy. You've got to pay the support act. You've got to pay your agent. You've got to pay your band. Like, you've got to pay the flights to get up there. You've got to pay for your hotel. It's like, dude, you add all that up. Like, you're at like four grand already. How much are you getting paid? If, if you get 100 people at... $40, you're only just breaking even, you know, so, and then the venue would probably take a cut of that as well, so it's, um, it's pretty hard, so I think probably just need a few more initiatives of, like, guaranteed fees for artists to come up and, you know, maybe the government needs to help a bit more in terms of funding to, to get people travelling a bit more. I mean, petrol's gone up a lot, hasn't it? Oh my gosh, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> but you're finding crowd numbers are significantly lower. Yeah, and it's across the board. Like my agent um, said that it's the same for everyone. Like things, things are just not moving the way they used to. I think we're. Um, I think we're being no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we are. Ding at ding, time. ding 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 ding. <laughs> Katie Steele, thank you. Thanks, guys.